people are becoming very interested in vegetable cooking for this reason because they don't just want to rely on a fake piece of chicken. Maybe instead, honestly, it could be, could I make this maitake mushroom into fried chicken? It's like, hell yeah, you can. You're listening to the Plant-Based Diet Podcast, where we talk about all things plant-based. I'm Esther Garfin, the host of this show and founder of Alternative Food Network. Join me and my amazing array of guests who are a mix of healthcare professionals, industry executives, and people with an interesting story to tell about their plant-based journey. Let us help you with your journey, wherever you're at, to learn the what, why, and how to eat plant-based. Today, I'm joined by Chef Matthew Ravenscroft, who in his own words, quote, wants to showcase the power of plants so you'll eat your damn veggies, end quote. He wants people to understand that plant-based eating can be fun, tasty, and gourmet. I saw today's guest leading a cooking demo at a food trade show, and I knew I had to have him on the show. You can't imagine what he did with a celery root. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited about this and having this conversation. It really was something to see what you did with that celery root. I don't know if you remember which trade show I'm talking about, but you did a cooking yeah. demo. I think it was at Sayal. It was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was great. So so I'm so happy that you could come, you had the time to come on the show. So let's talk a little bit about you. You are a chef. Yes. You are a plant-based chef, one of the great ones in my home city of Toronto. When did you become plant-based? That's the thing. So, I mean, that's a big question. Really, like, my curiosity to cooking plant-based started before I ever was, to be honest. I really wanted this box to live in because I thought it was very exciting. I thought possibilities could happen that maybe I wasn't seeing before. So even before I ever considered like not having animal products in my life, I was cooking it um, because I was like, I did believe there was, and I do still believe that there's a, there, this is the future of cooking and people are doing this and it's interesting and there's not a lot of people doing it, which I thought was super interesting as well. And then things kind of started to progress for me and change, um, probably in the pandemic. I was like, okay, reading books. And, and I was like, I would be kind of interested in, in seeing how this works for me. I used to be extremely, extremely vegan. Uh, and I'll, I'll use that word intentionally when I was in high school. And it, and it actually did work well for me at that time as well. So I knew my body, it worked for my body. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try this thing and see how it works. Um, granted it changes sometimes now in my day to day, I have a two year old and sometimes he needs like coaxing or he wants to share his food with me and building a healthy, positive relationship for him with food. Cause he's not plant-based sometimes requires these things and like, um, whatever. Um, so yeah, for probably like two, three years, I've really been interested in myself consuming plants because I also, uh, like that's how I want to cook. I want to cook plants. And we're going to, I mean, the the crux of this episode is really to talk a bit about the evolution of Mm plant-based cooking. And so I would love to hear your take on how you've seen plant-based eating evolve over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that I thought was so interesting in having this conversation was that, you know, I'm 33, I think I kind of forget sometimes. (laughs) Uh, but when I was like 17, uh, I I was again, like vegan, like capital V hard vegan and, uh, eating options were very lackluster. Then it was like a cardboardy kind of, uh, sandwich meat, a cheese that would never melt uh, milk that was separated. It was very lackluster in my opinion and actually made it not very compelling to be plant-based. <laughs> right, <laughs> like right. when I was the time, uh, 17 years ago, uh, I didn't even know anyone else who was mm-hmm. <laughs> and like my whole, every, you know, everyone I'd met and all these things, I didn't know anyone who was. And then compared to now, like the technology has changed, the food capabilities have changed. You know, I, I, I consulted on a brand that was like making a plant-based salmon that's raw to cooked. And I've just seen such a huge change, not only in the technology and, and the resulting food in terms of like CPG package goods, but also people's like interest in it. I think it's not so much pushing people away anymore. I think people in their normal day to day want to eat more vegetables. They're more curious about these things. 
I think people who have dairy are, are drinking more oat milk than ever. Oats having a real glow up situation. <laughs> so all these things are kind of um, just working, coinciding that people are more plant focused, I find now in their eating um, than ever before, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. And would you, you know, even before 17 years ago, if you, I don't know, maybe going back to before I was born, you know, somewhere in the sixties mm-hmm. where maybe there, it was maybe hippies or, or bohemians reading plant-based mm-hmm. it's evolved. Certainly that subculture, if you want to call it that, um, that no longer applies to the plant-based world. For sure. I mean, I think even if we look at restaurants as kind of like, uh, to me, sometimes restaurants are kind of like trickle downs for in terms of how people eat, they can be a bit of a trend forecasting. I, I remember being at like a wedding and asking for a vegan meal, um, all those years ago. And it was literally like one tomato cut into wedges <laughs> and like a one thick ass red onion ring just popped around. And I was like, this can't be it. Like this cannot be the, the creativity that could exist within this world. Um, so, so values have shifted because people are also more open to the challenge or they're more open to what can I produce that's totally plant-based. And like, if I am good at cooking and I am creative at cooking, like what could I make? And I think now people see it as something like very interesting to, to get an understanding of. So the value in terms of who's producing the food has changed as well. It's no longer like a big gripe. People are like, whoa, like, yeah, what can we do here? Mm -hmm. So speaking of of what you can do, how do you approach your dishes? And and when you're thinking you're going to make something and you want to make it gourmet, you know, at that level Mm -hmm. of cooking, what's Mm -hmm. your thought process? Um, You know, I I think I'm someone who really cooks by feeling. um, And I think that's because I've done it for long enough. So I think maybe, yeah, breaking down like what I try to include is important. To me, plant-based eating is very um, monotonous in textures a lot of time. It's very soft. It's, um, there's not a lot of crunch happening. So I always am like, we have to put crunch. Like there has to be some sort of crunching thing to create diversity in the bite because I love a bite that is like acidic. Maybe it has something soft like the roasted celery that we were talking about. Um, and then there is something crunchy, be it like a nut, a seed or like pickled onions or something like that. Um, so I always try to create some sort of balance. So for me, the vegetable is like always, I try to make the focal point one vegetable. I love that. Like I want it to be the hero. I always want a great sauce that complements it, be it herbaceous or like a romesco or a cashew cream or an onion sauce, whatever that is. I need to understand what that vegetable is to understand what goes with it. To me, I also do believe like most things will go together and in their own way, right? Like if I'm grilling something, I always put something herbaceous and bright and acidic with it because it just, these two things work extremely well together. Um, If it's something like pan roasted, maybe I want to apply something with a bit of smokiness and richness to it to kind of uh, cut that out. So I always try to do something that will create balance within the dish. I think nuttiness adds this like, um, texture that works really well. And then the last thing that I think is missing in a lot of plant-based dishes is the kind of like umami, like a depth of flavor and unctuousness sort of thing. So be it like uh, mushroom demi is something that I incorporate or glazing it and brushing it with something that has like tamari or uh, soy or miso or something like this. I think that would be super helpful in terms of elevating it, making it gourmet. It's really just refining and becoming intentional with what you're putting on the plate right? Sometimes pulling back a little bit and making it more refined by not having too much stuff. I think I, I, mm-hmm. everyone falls into that trap sometimes. Like to me, having like three components tops is great and it looks very clean and nice. And the reality unfortunately is like we eat with our eyes. Yeah. So we want, we want to see a wow factor when it sits down in, in that level of cooking. I think there's tons of great cuisine that doesn't require that at all. And you can have an amazing meal, but this is just what we're talking about in terms of like higher end dining. Just to recap. So when you approach something on a gourmet level, one vegetable that's takes center yeah. stage and then yeah. there is a sauce of some sort. Yeah. And then what was the third thing? Like texture, texture. like some oh, crunch, right? Yeah, crunch because um, I find my mouth gets tired. I also would say like something unexpected is nice. Like if we're serving a pea dish, 
great white chocolate on it, like kind of vegan white chocolate. Wow. Um, it's a great combination, you know, like something, or it's with, with peas. It's amazing. Like um, green you know, peas. For, yeah. Like, so okay. you can get a vegan white chocolate or you can get a great, whatever, you yeah. know, um, great white chocolate over it. Um, something like that. I think, um, you know, in, in celery act, when we get closer to fall, I do like a blueberry demi with it. Like it's unexpected, mm. but it goes extremely well together. I think those are small things that can take plant based a little bit higher too. It's like, wow, this person's really thought about this. Like, do you do research and see what other chefs are making and then you try it yourself? Or like, are you, do you just make this up? Like, oh, something blueberry yeah. with the celery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, and I wouldn't say it works all the time, but I really think about what do I want to eat and what have I never eaten? Huh. Right. So that to me is a compelling force when I cook. Right. Um, and I would do it when I ate animal products and I would do it. Uh, to this day, I'm just like, what do I want to make? And that to me is the thing that I'm going to end up doing. Like if I see the celery rack, I'm like, wow, I really want to spiralize a celery rack and then baste it in like vegan butter, basically. Um, that to me sounded really good. And it was, it was really good. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I try, I, I, it's not intentional. It's not that I don't think there are a lot of people doing great stuff out of there. It's just, I'm, I'm kind of like impulsive with what I want to make and eat and enjoy. It's like a craving, like I'm satiating something for me because as much as it is for other people when I make content and I make food, there's a part of it that's satiating my own curiosity. Right. And your creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now if, if, some, done. if someone's listening and they're going to just be in their kitchen making some plant-based dish and they want to elevate it a notch, do you have any tips for them? For sure. I think understanding what is this vegetable, right? Like is I wouldn't like braise a head of broccoli, but maybe I could like lightly braise a carrot. So I think understanding the first thing is like, what are you cooking? Right. For me, broccoli, I would like sear it in a pan or grill it, or I don't think I would really blanch it. Cause that feels kind of boring unless you blanch it in something very flavorful. But I think understanding what the vegetable is you're cooking first and then going deeper is maybe adding some sort of sauce. For me, the sauce is, is kind of everything, right? It, it helps to elevate the dish and kind of put it on a bit more of a pedestal. Um, and I think it's also a fun way to explore, like what is a new flavor? So we're able to introduce and complement one, one with the other thing. Um, and I think, I mean, applying techniques that you would normally apply to meat uh, as a vegetable, like, why can't you grill a carrot? Mm -hmm. Why can't I cover something in salt like a carrot? I'm going to just keep saying carrots. Cover something in salt like a carrot. And let all the moisture get pulled out of it over time. Rinse it off and cook it. Like, uh, we can do these things. And I think sometimes, uh, this is not at, directed towards anyone, but I think sometimes in plant-based cooking, it's stuck in a mentality that has never really interacted with meat. So it's like, why can't you sous vide a piece of celery ac or sous vide, I don't know, something else, but like seeing things in the same level as you would with a piece of meat or a piece of fish can have fantastic, wonderful results. Like pan searing a giant lion's mane mushroom and pressing it and searing it over again, like a steak and then glazing it. Like it's amazing. Like it, it's really fascinating. So I think kind of applying similar idea that you would to a piece of meat with, cause it's the same respect, right? It's about that. This right. isn't just an afterthought. It's becoming more intentional with what you're doing when you cook it. Right? It's not just broccoli. It's like someone grew this and broccoli grew itself. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> um, when, when you say the first thing is that someone should understand their vegetable, mm -hmm. what exactly do you mean by that? For sure. Um, I would say it's understanding the best methods to cook that product. That would be the, that would be my opinion. So it's like, um, when we say broccoli versus a potato, let's say I won't put broccoli in a pot and boil it like a potato to me, that doesn't get what I want out of it. But do I know that broccoli or rapini or some sort of brassica can withstand being grilled or seared very hard for sure. But a potato can't withstand that. Like you can't really sear a potato like a steak. It'll, it will still be raw. Mm -hmm. And if you do want to like hassle back cutting it so that it can be, that's a difference, right? Or like, you know, a rutabaga, you might be able to put it on the grill, um, but it might not cook and be done. 
by the time it's like either totally black on the inside and raw on the, you know, black on the outside, raw on the inside. Or so I think first it's like, what do we want to do with this product? Right. Cauliflower. Can you grill it? Sure. Um, it will take forever because it needs some sort of moisture to cook and roast down. So it's like, maybe you grill it at the end Mm -hmm. and maybe we cook it in a Dutch oven in the oven before with some, some sauce or some flavor underneath. So it's steaming and then we take it off and caramelize it. So I think it's just like, how are we going to cook this thing? And what is the best method to, to cooking this thing? And is there a resource for that, that like someone, someone can go online and look up? I honestly, I, I rely on Google so heavily. I just, I just type in like, like boil this or like cooking that vegetable. Right. Or it's like, what is this vegetable? Like I hold up a Jerusalem artichoke and it's like, what is this? Like, how can I cook a Jerusalem artichoke? And it's like, you can boil it. I don't really, you can roast them, but they're not, it's not great for certain reasons. Uh, we can make a chip out of it, all these things. But I think we want to understand first, like, what is this thing? Use Google as a resource and just type in what that is. And someone's done it. I feel like Mm -hmm. I've never, I've never seen no Google results come from it. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, you know, people want to do it. They, and they want to understand their vegetable. Then it's good to know that they could just find information out on Google that that's what you do. It honestly is. Yeah. Like a lot of, uh, you could, you could definitely look in books and all these things, but it, it will take far more time. Like, okay. you know, the library of Alexandria is already there. It's Google. We're recording this in 2023. Uh, mm-hmm. Any emerging ingredients that uh, maybe you've cooked with recently or you haven't, but you want to mm-hmm. try? Yeah. You know what I really love? And it's kind of an unexpected thing. There is like kind of a, I love a tomato and berry salad and I'm like really hot on this when the season is approaching. Um, but I think what we're seeing is this intersection of like fruits as something as a savory component, and like a blueberry demi and stuff like that. Or like I saw a tomato ice cream with currants on it recently. Like I think people are starting to blur the lines in terms of what these things are and creating something like new and special, like honey's ice cream down the road for me did like a spinach ice cream and it's unreal. Really? Um, yes. Yeah. What did it taste really like? Good. It just tastes like fresh, like, cl- like, a, like chlorophyll in like a delightful way. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's very rich because honey's ice cream is very rich and it's exceptional, um, in my opinion, of course. But like, I think that people are starting to not be so scared of eating vegetables. So it's like, they're more open to it. I think in terms of like trend, you know, it's like what is on trend. I don't know. I think just eating more veggies and being more receptive to these things is kind of, kind of on trend. Like, what do you feel you've noticed that is really happening right now in the veggie world? I think plant-based meats are still hot, but like people are more into whole foods. I was just going to say whole food plant-based. That's yeah. I mean, that's what we also promote or talk about a lot on this show. Is it's whole, important. Whole food plant-based for the health purposes, for the health oh. aspects of it. So, yeah. Yeah. It can be a nice treat. Um, but again, I think this is where people are becoming very interested in vegetable cooking for this reason. Because they don't just want to rely on a fake piece of chicken. Maybe instead, honestly, it could be, could I make this my talkie mushroom into fried chicken? It's like, hell yeah, you can. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's like, I think people are looking to kind of sub some things out for other things and moving away from a processed good and seeing what else is kind of out there. Agreed. Agreed. And again, we, yeah. we definitely talk a lot about that. Do you uh, work a lot with legumes as well, like lentils and beans and chickpeas? Yeah, I mean, I think looking at um, TikTok and Instagram, at least in my feed, beans are like hot right now. That's a trend. Like a cannelli, cannellini bean is very hot. Like I think that I see a lot of it like a brothy bean situation. Uh, And I think they're a huge source of nutrients. Like there's a there there seems to be a huge benefit to it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do I do make recipes based on it. I don't necessarily know if I serve it like in dinners, but I will definitely have for myself and I'll definitely produce content based on it because I think uh, it's very on trend and it's very simple. Like you can create a great frothy bean with like lemon and herbs and like it's it's probably one of my top 10 favorite things to eat because it's so simple, it's so filling and satiating, and there's just like this warmth that comes from it. 
like if I picture like I'm sitting on the coast or like sitting in Italy, watching the world go by eating this thing. And I think that um, there is a huge, you know, it's, it's very easy to add in to just kind of like up that protein. Like, you know, maybe you're doing like a white bean and onion puree and it's just like, you just did that very easily and very fast and you've changed the protein content of that product. Yeah, you know, we uh, we produce another show as well. And in that show, the host made a Caesar salad with, a, I can't remember which bean it was, but the, the dressing was a bean mm-hmm. dressing for Unreal. the Caesar salad. Yeah. And I made it at home and it was great. Yeah, yeah. Lots Stuff of like garlic. That, I think is- yeah, I love this is I love plant based cooking for this. I, I think it can happen in in like omnivore cooking as well. But when someone's like that's in this and they're like kind of shocked, right? Like you have this like creamy almond dressing, and people are like, are you serious? Like plant based cooking to me is super fun and invigorating for this reason because there's something kind of unexpected that you can produce out of it, or you can be like, this chocolate mousse has tofu, in it. and you're like, for yeah, sure it does, right, of right. course, <laughs> right? And it's like that is I think kind of cool actually. And I was on your website, and you do have some recipes on your website. I'll, I'll just mention that. The only thing, and I'll, I'll ask you, I'm allergic to sesame seeds, so I can't right. eat tahini. So yes. can you, rep- when a recipe calls for that, can that be easily replaced? Yeah, I think I think if you're, someone's open to like a pumpkin seed butter or like a nut butter, I think there's like a certain creaminess that is being strived for using tahini or using something like that. So I think if you're, if that's the case, it's like refer to something kind of in that same world, like another seed butter or another nut butter would be an alternative and water. Of course, like, um, like a cashew cream is amazing and super creamy. And I love cashew cream. Um, if someone's allergic to both seeds and nuts, that can be a bit of a bigger thing. I, I, I don't actually know if someone has the solution to that. I would love, I would love to see that. Um, because I even know like, you know, like not peanut butter is like sunflower butter, um, yeah. and stuff like that. So that can present its own obstacle, but maybe it is like a bean puree instead. Yeah. Tahini mm-hmm. has a very distinct, uh, flavor to me. So mm-hmm. sometimes it, 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 I wouldn't say, I don't really believe anything is anything can't be switched out in a recipe basically, okay. unless it has to do with like the structure of something, um, like sugar has it, uh, adds structural elements to baking in some cases or, um, eggs can, or flax can be used for binding stuff like that. But flavor wise, I think we can play around with it and the world spins on either way, <laughs> which is very freeing. Like it's very freeing to remember like a recipe is, is not gossip. Like we can, we can play within that box as well. Switch things out that we prefer at the end of the day, we want to enjoy something. Yeah. So if we don't like that thing or we're allergic, it's like, take it out switch it out and see what that's like. I know. The problem is for someone like me, I need a recipe. I'm not creative in that way. I yeah. need a recipe. But but there are yeah. many people, my husband, he just does it off the cuff. Just riffs, riffs yeah, it. Yeah. Totally, yeah. Like totally. I'll be like, oh, I'll, I'll put almond butter and add a little bit of water and then kind of get the same consistency as a tahini and call it a day there. Right, right, right. Yeah. So if someone wants to find you somewhere online, where, where can they find you? Yeah. Across the board, it's the Dirty Raven, uh, dirtyraven.com, Dirty Raven on Instagram, um, threads, which feels weird, and TikTok. These are all the same things. And if anyone wants to email me, you can get it within um, within my Instagram if you want to DM me. I mean, i I'll, so open to questions and love connecting with people in all these unique different ways. Um, that to me is part of the beauty of the internet for all its faults is that we get to connect with all these great people. And just before we go, what is your vision for plant-based cuisine? I want plant-based cuisine to kind of be on the same level, um, as every cuisine. I don't, I don't want to actually differentiate between these two things. I want it to just be like, we're eating vegetables and that tastes good. Right. Like to me, if we can get to a point where it's not like that restaurant is vegan or vegetarian, it's just like that restaurant is great Mm -hmm. and that recipe is great. And like period, full stop. And it's already happening. Like there are places doing this. Um, But that to me is kind of the vision. Well, thank you so much. I, again, I'm yeah. so happy that you had the time to come on the show today. Uh, yeah. I don't think I have interviewed a plant-based chef 
yet on this show. So that was kind of fun and new. Super Uh, fun. Well, thank you again. Thanks for having me. I hope you found this informative. Please rate, subscribe, or leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. It really helps the discoverability of our show. If you're on social media, please follow us at Alternative Food Network on Facebook and Instagram. We also publish a monthly newsletter that includes plant-based recipes, recipe videos, and our latest podcasts. You can subscribe by going to our website at alternativefoodnetwork.com and click the subscribe button. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Prolon. Until next time, thanks for listening. All content provided or opinions expressed in this podcast are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. Please seek advice from your doctor or other qualified healthcare practitioner.